Hi everyone, I'm Eileen with Raycraft Books and I am so excited because this is our first Magic Mirror Night with all you middle graders. And we've got four books in this series. One that we're going to be reading tonight, The Tomb of Time, just a couple of chapters to get you started. The others in the series are The Visionary Voyage, The Traveler's Tale, the Wall of Willows. Now, why did we choose the Tomb of Time to start with? Well, even though it's book three in the series, our editors love this book. And not only that, we asked readers and they agreed that we should start with this one. And what's so cool about this series is that you can read any of these out of sequence. They're all awesome. Now you're going to meet Marco and Miranda. They are the characters, the main characters in these books, and they are going to take us on a time travel adventure. So let's get started. In the story, you're going to read some things that feel a little real, some things that don't. It's up to you to try and separate fact from fiction. But I will tell you this, the magic mirror really does exist in museums. And as we read through the series, I'll even find some pictures of them to show you. So let's step inside and read a chapter or two and have an adventure with Marco and Miranda. Let's get started. The Tomb of Time. Chapter One, Mysterious Lines. The doorbell rang. Neither of the two boys in the living room reacted. Thin, waifish Marco, still as a statue, sat reading a book in an overstuffed chair. Legs draped fluidly over its arm. His left leg occasionally twitched. His short, chubby friend, Viren, lined up tiny soldiers into a platoon formation on a coffee table nearby. The stillness seemed to have slowed down the speed at which sound traveled. Viren eventually glanced briefly across at his buddy. It was Marco's house, so surely it was his job to answer the door but the smaller boy didn't move. Viren, a school friend who was visiting to do some homework, went back to his task, now rearranging the soldiers into an attack formation. He assumed there must be someone else in the house, perhaps a housekeeper whose job it was to open the door. Half a minute later, the bell rang again, Doorbell, mumbled Mirren. Yeah, murmured Marco, not looking up. Shouldn't you answer it? Marco, engrossed in his book, looking up after two or three seconds, said, huh? Oh no, we don't answer the door. We almost never answer the door. What if it's something important? Marco, who had immediately returned to reading, once again took a couple of seconds to finish scanning a paragraph before languidly looking up. Hmm, oh, we have a system. Whoever is upstairs checks the remote viewer thingy. If it's someone important, we answer the door. Mira's closer, she'll do it. Right on cue, there was a distant yelp from a female voice. It was an indistinctly shouted sentence of several words, apparently hollered from behind closed doors. What? bellowed Marco at the top of his voice without moving from the chair. The voice came again, this time a little louder, as if a door had been opened a crack. Can you check the viewer? I'm in the bathroom, said his sister's voice. 
I'm going to be a while. The boy sighed. Okay, he replied, reluctantly lowering his book. There was nothing he liked less than being forced to emerge from a book in which he had happily lost himself. Come on, he said to his friend. I'll show you the remote viewer. I made it out of four periscopes and a flashlight. He put his finger to his lips to indicate that they should be as quiet as possible. The two boys scampered out of the room and up the stairs, stopping at the landing of the old house. The doorbell rang a third time, accompanied by a cursory knock as they reached the viewer, a plastic periscope set into the window. Mailman, said Marco, see? Viren closed one eye and peered at the periscope opening. He found himself looking straight down at a man in some sort of yellow and red uniform, holding a large soft bag with a shoulder strap. Shouldn't you see what he's trying to deliver before he goes away? It's probably some sort of special delivery. He's turning to leave. No, no he's not. He's getting out a pen to write a note. But Marco had leaned over to another mechanical device attached to the window, this time some sort of speaking tube he put his lips to it. Apologies for the delay. We will be right down to open the door. Please stay where you are. Thank you. The postman looked up to see where the sound was coming from. The two boys raced down to the front door. Flicking the locks, Marco swung open the door to reveal a surprised man holding a small package that was little more than a fat envelope. Special delivery, speedy post courier for Ms. Miranda Lee and Master Marco Lee, he said. That you guys? I'm Marco and this is Miranda, said Marco, pointing to Viren. Shut up, said Viren, slapping his friend's arm. I'm Marco and Miranda is my sister and she's upstairs, pooping. Too, too much information, laughed the postman. Any adults around to sign? The receipt should really be signed by an adult. Is your sister older than you? There was a distant flushing noise and a door opened. The three of them turned around as Miranda, known, as, known to family and friends as Mira, appeared at the top of the stairs and walked grandly down. May I help you? She asked, flicking water off her fingers. I'm the lady of the house. I was just doing a um, project upstairs. Was it a big one? Marco asked, giggling. Viren laughed too. Probably huge, he said. The mailman trying to keep his face straight said, I need an adult to sign this. Mira grabbed the pen out of his hand. I'll sign it, I always sign. To the man, she looked about 12 or maybe somewhere in her early teens. Definitely not 18 yet. But after a slight pause, he decided to let her have her way. There was something bossy about her. You didn't say no to Miranda Lee. Well, okay, I guess that'll be all right. Thanks, miss, he said, taking the receipt back. Now you can get back to your project. She turned to the two boys who were chuckling at the postman's words. What are you two laughing at, idiots? They shook their heads to signify that no answer would be forthcoming and followed her as she went into the kitchen to get some scissors. I meant to ask said Viren. How come you guys live by yourselves? I mean, like, how do you get away with it? It's a long story, said Marco, but basically our parents went on a trip and left us in the care of our grandpa. And at pretty much the same time, our grandpa went on a trip, leaving us in the care of our parents. They were due to return at roughly the same time he left. 
so like each thinks you are being looked after by the other. Man, that's cool, said Baron. You guys are so lucky. Doesn't anybody check? Our parents are in a place with no phones, like West Papua or Amazon or somewhere, said Mira. They do that sort of thing all the time. They did call a couple of times, but we said we were doing fine and they didn't need to rush home, so they extended their trip. We didn't like it at first, but we kind of got used to it. They've been gone nearly three months, said Marco. You've been free for three months? Wow, you are so lucky. Your grandpa didn't come back either? While Mira got the scissors from a drawer, Marco explained, grandpa used to be a historian. He's supposed to have retired, but he never stops. He goes around exploring and collecting old stuff. He's always on the road and he's not a cell phone sort of person. He writes letters and sends packages instead. Like this one? Yeah, said Mira the tip of her tongue protruding from her mouth as she carefully snipped open one side of the package. It's from him, for sure. I can tell by the writing. She pulled out a letter. Another piece of paper fluttered from within it. Marco grabbed it. It's a poem, he said, surprise in his voice. Is that it? Said Viren, disappointed. A letter and a poem? Before they could answer, there came the sound of a car honking. Viren went to the window, recognizing the sound. It's my mom, he said, I gotta go. He ran back to the room where they had been sitting to get his backpack. Less than a minute later, he was in the car and driving off. Marco stood outside and waved to him. Then he raced back into the house to see what the letter said. Look. It's got an address this time, Mira said, and a warning. Grandpa says that he wants to take, he wants us to take the magic mirror somewhere, but he says we need to be careful as there will be some highly dangerous people about. Marco, who was nervous by nature, shivered. He didn't like the sound of that. To distract himself, he looked at the poem. What's it say? his sister asked, looking over his shoulder. He showed it to her. A baffling title stood over a piece of poetry just four mysterious lines long. The title said, Fast Ag, Changeable, 11. The poem, this beauty treatment makes you ugly. This medicine will cause your death. Think of a metal firm as water. The mirror shows your final breath. What do you think it's about? Mira asked. It's kind of gruesome. Although she was older than her brother, he was an avid reader of everything he could get his hands on. And she thought he had more chance of deciphering this message than she had. Don't know he said, accepting the unspoken assignment. I'll have to think. They looked at each other. Both knew they were having the same thought. Mira spoke it out loud. To grandpa's study? To grandpa's study, said her, bo her brother. They turned to run down the corridor to a room they had long thought of as their personal Aladdin's cave filled with artifacts, books, and fascinating objects, such as oriental puzzle boxes, which they spent hours learning how to open. But before they reached it, they heard a sound at the door. This time it was not a doorbell. Someone with a key was entering the house. Could it be Miss Modi? Or had their parents or their grandfather returned at last? Chapter Two. We've got to read chapter two because we're just about to find out what the magic mirror is. Chapter two, 
the trouble game. We are going to be in massive trouble, said the teacher, twirling the right side of his mustache, something he always did when he was nervous. Life had been stressful lately, which meant that, he, that the right side of his mustache was curly and came to a fine vertical point, just like a Victorian pantomime villain, while the left side drooped and ended in a blunt, shaggy line. His wife shook her head. It'll be fine. I've been very careful about this. The two teachers, Jay Aldred and Anya Modi, were the only two teachers in school who knew that Mira and Marco Lee were living by themselves. They sat in the staff room fretting. Mr. Aldred was convinced that they should have reported the children to the authorities, not to get them in trouble. I know you wouldn't want to do that, but to make sure they are looked after, anything could happen, something horrible could happen, and then who will end up being blamed? Ms. Modi gave him a tired half smile. And that's your real concern, isn't it? That we'll end up in big trouble? Well, as I've told you before, I've been really careful. If they were younger, it would be illegal to leave them home alone. And I would definitely have reported them to the police. But Mira just scrapes into the old enough category. The male teacher spun the end of his mustache nervously. Look, we may be okay in legal terms, but that's not the point. We could still be criticized for not getting help for them. His wife knew he was worried they would lose their jobs. She shook her head. I, I don't think so. I visit them twice a week at least. They now have a woman who comes for a few hours every other day to clean and cook. They're happy and healthy and their grades haven't particularly suffered. In most cases, they do okay, nothing special, but they both got A's in history last week. They've become passionately interested in it. Look at this. She sorted through some papers and flipped two sheets over to her husband. He scanned them and nodded. Wow, he said, I see what you mean. They've gone from zeros to heroes in the history department. What happened? Ms. Modi leaned back in her chair and pondered for a while before answering. To be totally honest, I don't know. They've taken to hanging out in their grandfather's study. He was a very well-known historian and archeologist before he retired. They spend hours reading his books and studying his artifacts. You mean they are somehow teaching themselves? That doesn't make sense. I have a classroom full of books, but most of my students don't teach themselves anything. And you told me the boy was good at a, a good reader, but his sister was average. She nodded slowly. You're right. It's not just being surrounded by books. They have this really weird game they play. They, they sort of, her voice trailed off. She suddenly gave him a stern look. What, he asked, confused at the sudden hostility in her face. If I tell you, can you take off your super skeptic hat for a moment and don't make fun of me for half believing what they tell me? Me, make fun of you? Would I ever do such a thing? Yes, she said, at least once a week. Tell me, he said with a half apologetic look. She leaned forward and joined her hands together. Their grandfather found this thing called a magic mirror. It's an old artifact from China. You see them in museums sometimes. They sit around and look at their grandfather's books and pictures and collections, and then they play this game. They put the mirror into a small round window so that light shines right through it. It projects lines on the walls, making the room look different. Then they convince themselves that they are in a different time and place. 
So, for example, they like found themselves and uh, uh, found themselves on Zhang He's treasure ship as it sailed the oceans. And on another occasion, they went to the Taklamakan Desert with Marco Polo to meet the heirs of Genghis Khan. Only they don't think of it as a game. They see themselves as really time traveling. He gave her an aha look. So that's how they became so good at history. They study it and then they act it out in games. That way it sticks in their minds. That's an that's actually a brilliant way of learning. We should use it in other lessons. She didn't rerun. She didn't return his smile, but just looked thoughtful. Now he was puzzled. What? She looked at him without replying. He continued. Are you saying that they're not acting? That the magic, the mirror? really is magic in some way? You don't believe in time travel, do you? She thought for a moment before shaking her head. No, of course not. It must be some sort of imaginary game. But she spoke with a curious lack of conviction. We ought to use the same method in school more. Get the history classes to act out the periods of history they're studying, her husband said. She gave a single nod still thoughtful. What is it? He asked. There cannot be any other explanation, surely. As you say, there can't be any other explanation. Yet at the, the same time, I find myself amazed at just how powerful the experience seems to be. When Mira first came to me and told me about Zheng He's ship, it was like she was talking about a real place, somewhere she'd spent several days exploring. It just means she has a great imagination. Marco is a book addict. I would expect him to have a great imagination, but Mira is not much of a reader. I can't, I can't work out where she gets all the details from. And there's something else too. He had never seen her so puzzled. What? She pulled papers. She pulled from her papers a sheet of paper showing a picture of an ancient metal disc with scalloped edges. Chinese pictographs were finely etched on it. The magic mirror itself intrigues me. I mean, with my, hedge, my, my educator hat on. He looked at the picture. It looks like a metal shield of some sort, she agreed. But it has a lot of strange qualities. First, you can polish it up and use it as a normal mirror, getting a reasonable sort of reflection. But if you hold it up to the light, so they say, the sun shines right through it, or the moon, in the case of the kid's mirror. It must be a very fine, thin metal. So you'd think, but no, it's a fairly solid, thick metal. They're surely made of bronze. Scientists think it is made in such a way that there are tiny invisible openings through which light flows, maybe at a molecular level. That's a bit weird. That's not all that strange. There are markings on it. So when a bright light shines through it, the markings are projected onto the walls. She paused for effect. And he prompted her. In several cases, scientists have found the markings projected on the walls don't match the markings on the surface. It's a mystery. He sat back in his chair and nodded his fingers together. That sounds, that does sound deliciously weird. He said, I do love a touch of magic with my afternoon tea. They spent a few minutes in silence with J. Aldred looking at the papers on magic mirrors his wife had collected. 
When the bell rang, she scooped up the papers and patted them into a neat stack. I've made up my mind, she said. I'm going to go see Mira and her brother tonight. Or you can do it if I can't get out of visiting my grandma. We're not going to report them to the authorities, but I'm going to insist that they report themselves to some responsible guardians before the end of this week. Not the police or social workers, but family members. There must be an aunt or a sister-in-law or a family of cousins or someone who can take responsibility for them. Maybe just a neighbor. The other teacher agreed. Good idea. It's not right for you to take so much responsibility on your shoulders. They walked towards the door of the staff room. What have you got this afternoon, he asked. She wrinkled her nose to make an expression of distaste. Something pretty horrible, she said. We're doing an art project supporting the Asian history unit. It's basically looking at the first emperor of China. Brutality, madness, mass murder. I have a departmental staff meeting, pretty much the same. Thank you for joining us on Magic Mirror Night. And I'll see you tomorrow for the next chapter or two as we follow Marco and Miranda on this adventure. Bye-bye.